So, uh, as thank you, Neil, um, and thank you to Ocumo UK for inviting me to talk today about um, why we should undertake surveillance in ocular melanoma. Um, as Neil said, I'm an interventional radiologist by trade, and I work in Southampton. Um, so, I just start us off. Obviously, we we know all this uh, background information that ocular melanoma is a rare form of cancer. Approximately 600 cases new cases in the UK each year and about four to 5,000 in the US. Uh, a youngish age, average age of presentation, sort of 55 to 65, which is lower than we traditionally see for other types of cancers and a slight prominence from male to females. Um, we know it occurs in the pigment producing cells in the eye, often asymptomatic in about 30 to 40 percent of patients, but symptoms can include blurred vision, flashing lights and seeing brown or dark patches in the white areas of the eye. So I know that surveillance is a debated topic and slightly controversial, but I just thought I would just go through the evidence for and against surveillance and the different types of options we have for surveillance in ocular melanoma. So we know that the treatment of primary ocular melanoma is invariably successful, and that does not necessarily have an impact on the long-term mortality of patients. We know that 50% of patients will have metastases that occur in another part of the body, and 50% of patients will have liver-only disease. 90% of patients uh, with metastases elsewhere will also have liver metastases. So, and we know that liver involvement is generally the cause of death in most patients with metastatic uval melanoma, and that's from liver failure or compression of uh, bile ducts from, from tumours, um, and unfortunately when the disease does reach the liver, the median survival is 2 to 12 months, and the one-year survival of 10 to 15 percent, which is, which is very low. So from this, we can see that the liver should be our, our main focus when looking for secondary deposits, because it, it is the most important site and the most associated with the mortality. So uh, several studies have been done that show that the majority of patients at initial diagnosis, metal, metastatic disease is not detectable. And we don't know, is this because the disease is not there or is it because the disease is too small to appreciate clinically or on imaging? So even though there are massive advances in imaging, sometimes it's just not possible to see these areas. Um, so these studies all show that there was a very low percentage of uh, patients at initial diagnosis who had uh, metastatic disease, although there was a lot of difference in the way that they were uh, having a look. So uh, the COMS trial looked at LFTs and chest X-rays. Uh, this study looked at PET scans, abdominal CT, and PET scans again. We know that the natural history of ocular melanoma is characterized by the development of metastases any time from initial diagnosis to several decades later. A precedent has kind of been set for other cancers that commonly spread to the liver. So this is an extract from the NICE guidelines for the management of colorectal cancer. And you can see that it says they offer a contrast and CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to patients being assessed for metastatic disease for colorectal cancer. For breast cancer, Again, assessed for the presence of extent of visceral metastases using a combination of radiography, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. Unfortunately for ocular melanoma, even though the guidelines from 2015 have been accredited by NICE, they haven't actually published um, a NICE guidance for surveillance in ocular melanoma. Um, who should undergo surveillance? Difficult question. Should, we, should everyone who has ocular melanoma have surveillance for the rest of their life? Should we stratify surveillance basing, based on patients who have high-risk tumours? Um, we've, we've seen this before from uh, Dr Copeland, who mentioned this uh, Liverpool uveal melanoma prognostic calculator, which, which stratifies or generates a mortality curve based on several factors, including age, sex, uh, the size and diameter of the tuber, whether there's certain chromosomes, mitotic count, and this predicts the risk of metastases and threshold for the next scan. Um, unfortunately, it's quite difficult to identify patients as high risk and low risk because not all centres are using molecular genetic testing as they are in Liverpool. Um, and 
high risk in the UK cannot be based on genetic abnormalities alone. So there are all these other features, aside from the genetics, that can predict um, the likelihood of metastases. Ideally, there's, the feeling is that patients with a curative intent should be followed regularly. So what should be our aims of surveillance? Um, so we want to identify patients that have relapsed, i.e. who have developed metastatic disease, and we want to de detect metastatic disease as early as possible. Because we know if we are able to detect disease early, when the lesions are small, we have a greater chance of being able to treat those lesions. So what's currently happening in the UK? So there's quite a, a um, variation in the um, surveillance programs around the UK. Um, as I said, NICE has not produced any specific guidelines on this. Uh, patients in different parts of the country are screened and managed differently. Um, what options do we have for surveillance of liver metastases in ocular melanoma? So we generally, we have CT scans, which can include PET CT scans, ultrasound scans, and MRI scans. And I'm just going to go through each of those modalities and have a talk with you about some of the pros and cons of each one. So CT scans. So CT scans are good for looking at extra hepatic disease. They're very good for looking at lung nodules, lymph nodes around the liver, and bone lesions. Um, it's reproducible, so CT scans uh, can be compared and contrasted from previous scans. Um, they're fast to do. We don't need a radiologist present because uh, these are now performed by radiographers who can put cannulas in the arm and do the scan without a radiologist present and the scans can be reported later. Disadvantages are generally to look for liver metastases you need contrast which therefore needs a cannula um, which also and also needs us to check the uh, function of the kidneys which is what EGFR is to make sure that the patient can have contrast. There's also a radiation dose associated with CT scans and given that I said that this group of cancer patients is slightly younger than um, other types of cancers, we have to be aware that regular CT scanning, you know, in terms of radiation dose, is, it, that's quite significant. We may not detect all small and subtle lesions uh, in the liver by CT, and I'll show you an example of that later on. Um, ultrasound. So advantages of ultrasound are there's no radiation, it's cheap, uh, and it can be very effective in the hands of a skilled radiologist. Now, uh, as a sort of younger generation radiologist, um, we generally have not grown up as much using ultrasound, I would say. Um, the, my colleagues who are much older than me before the advent of MRI and CT are extremely skilled at ultrasound. And in those hands, ultrasound is an excellent modality at detecting um, liver metastases. However, it's a subjective examination. Me performing an ultrasound on someone is, would be completely different to another radiologist producing an ultrasound on someone because the images are done live and it's how each individual radiologist performs the examination. With the best will in the world, the liver is in a slightly awkward place to assess for liver metastases. It's under the rib cage. Certain patients are larger than others, which can make views difficult. So it, it really does require a skilled radiologist to perform these, these scans adequately to, to be able to detect metastases. So it's user dependent, patient dependent, it's not reproducible because it's subjective and it may not detect small and subtle disease and as I said needs a skilled radiologist. And I'll come on to this. So currently there is a problem in the UK with radiologists. Um, these, are, these are some extracts from the Royal College of Radiologists and this sort of demonstrates some of the problems that we're experiencing in the workforce in radiology. Um, we're having trouble recruiting radiologists. We're getting increasing requests for scans, which are increasingly complex. So there's you know, th large increases in reporting workload. Increasingly, scans are being outsourced, be it out of the country or to tele-reporting companies. So all this means that radiologists have less time and there's less of them available. Um, so being, having a, needing to have a radiologist or consultant radiologist present to perform an ultrasound scan may be difficult in the next, in the next few years. And I'll just draw your attention to the 22% of uh, UK radiologists who are expected to retire in the next five years. So that's the older generation of radiologists who are probably better at ultrasound scanning than the younger generation. So we'll come on to MRI. Um, so 
Again, no radiation is highly specific and sensitive for liver metastases. So, and it's reproducible, comparable, doesn't need a radiologist present, and it can be performed non-contrast in most cases. So there's a variety of sequences that can be performed in MRI scanning. Um, one of these sequences is diffusion-weighted imaging, which looks at uh, the free movement of water molecules within different tissues. And this is an excellent test, especially in ocular melanoma, where most of the lesions in the liver show restricted diffusion. And it means, even to a non-radiologist's eye, when looking at an MRI scan, these lesions light up like light bulbs. And I'll show you an example of that later on. So we don't need dye to identify these lesions necessarily, only if there's some, some debate about what they are defin definitively are. Disadvantages are that it takes time to do an MRI scan, um, requires a lot of resource, and it's more expensive. No such thing as a free lunch, unfortunately. So uh, M MRI, a contrast MRI or a non-contrast MRI is almost double the cost of an ultrasound scan. And unfortunately, with the with the number of patients we're talking about here, 600 new diagnoses a year in the UK, you, that, and if they were scanned, let, for example, twice a year, that, that's a significant cost uh, burden. What happens in Southampton? Um, so in Southampton, in our opinion, um, we conclude that if the aim is to find recurrence as early as possible, we should use the most reliable test, and for us, that's MRI scanning. So we perform an MRI liver without contrast every six months for life. Um, we would be guided by symptoms to perform other imaging investigations, so chest, abdomen, pelvis, in some patients we perform yearly or based on the symptoms they have. We have a fortnightly ocular melanoma meeting with radiologists, oncologists and liver surgeons to review imaging and discuss treatment options of liver metastases. Um, what's the evidence of surveillance? Um, so this paper from Augsburger um, did a systematic review of all the studies investigating surveillance from 1980 to 2009 and has found no survival benefit uh, in patients. So is it futile? Um, so these were small studies from single institutions and their screening methods were variable. So for anything from just liver function tests to MRI scans of the liver, there, there are no clinical trials that have, have proven any benefit or any uh, non-benefit. Um, there are some studies that throw weight behind the evidence for surveillance. Um, so several studies have demonstrated that periodic liver imaging allows identification of liver metastases prior to development of symptoms. Um, this study from Marshall in 2013 showed that 92% of patients who developed liver metastases were asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. And using six monthly contrast MRI, the, the, this allowed detection of metastases prior to changes in the liver function tests. Uh, they also reported that 65% of high-risk patients had a relapse at five years on non-contrast liver MRI. So should we be focusing our surveillance on this period, as in the first five years? Unfortunately, there's, there's very little evidence for, f to base decisions on frequency of scanning and duration of follow-up. Um, so although we currently scan, scan patients uh, every six months, th there could be an argument to scan them every four months. And, you know, how, uh, we should we scan patients for five years? And if they have no metastases over five years, should we stop or should we continue for life? Um, the, the, the research and academic priorities to generate evidence to change outcomes for cancer patients, but to set up a randomized controlled trial to compare methods of surveillance would cost millions and, and to do properly. And it's highly likely to confirm our educated belief that um, what, what we perform in Southampton is correct. Um, so why should we perform surveillance? Um, ten years ago, um, patients often didn't have the options that they have available now for the treatment of liver metastases. Um, so it's, I think it's important that we do survey patients now because they have options available. Um, so the potential cure, um, liver met metastectomy is only possible in approximately 10% of cases. Uh, in historical screening programs, and I think this is probably reflects the fact that the disease burden at the time of diagnosis is, is very high. Um, you know, we, we perhaps could increase the resection rate with strategic planning of screening. Um, if we perform screening, we can get increased and early detection, and this allows us to perform early management of liver metastases, facilitates early systemic treatment and trial enrollment before the disease burden becomes too high. Um, it's better for patients. Uh, we've 
we talked about anxiety issues. It facilitates uh, patient follow-up, ease of transfer and review of patients, uh, review of patients to centres specialising in liver directed treatments. Um, and it provides a link with oncology ser services and access to cancer specialist nurses. So talk about treatments of uh, liver disease in ocular melanoma. Um, we know that there's systemic chemotherapy, immunotherapy, which I'm not going to talk too much on. Um, there's surgery and ablation, which we use uh, quite commonly in Southampton. Um, the, the ability to perform metastectomy and uh, radical liver resections now is increased, and um, use, that used in the combination of ablation, which is insertion of a probe into the liver and either microwaving an area or freezing an area, uh, can, can provide a cure. Um, and then there's liver-directed therapies, which I'm involved in, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a bit more about chemosaturation. So I'll just give you an example here of, of a case. So I hope that these uh, scans work. So this is a 68-year-old man who we treated in Southampton. He was diagnosed with ocular melanoma in 2014, and his primary was treated with enucleation. He entered our surveillance program in 2015. And this was his first MRI scan. So I've shown these sequences that I'm showing, they look a bit blurry, but these are the diffusion weighted images so that I can show you what the lesions look like. Okay, so this is the first scan uh, as it plays through. So I'm just going to slow this down a bit. So uh, this is the liver here. This, is the, this structure here is the liver. And um, as we go through the scan, there's no evidence of any disease within the liver. So that was his first scan. Um, so he had six monthly uh, MRI scans, non-contrast, which showed no disease. On his sixth scan in November 2017, he developed multiple small volume liver lesions, and eight to ten of these, on, mainly on the right side of his liver. So this is his scan from, from then. So I'm just going to go through, and I'm just going to point these lesions out to you. So... These little white spots that you can see within the liver there, those are small metastases. And you can see how small they are and how difficult it would be to see these on other modalities, on ultrasound, CT, for example. So he's got about eight to 10 lesions here in the liver. He, interestingly, he was, he was discussed at our MDT and he was enrolled in the focus study which is uh, a study looking at uh, chemo uh, saturation versus best alternative care. Um, and as part of that study, he had a CT scan a month later as part of the protocol. And I'll just show you this CT scan. So this is the liver here. And, you know, it's very, very difficult to see any of the lesions in there. Usually the lesions on CT appear as sort of darker lesions. And if we, if we scan through, I mean, you'd be hard pushed to detect any of those lesions, certainly not all 10. So it, it, CT is not as sensitive as MRI for detecting these lesions. Um, he had uh, four cycles of Delcath chemosaturation, and he actually has had a complete response. So this is his most recent scan, which was done uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and if we go through his liver those lesions that were previously lighting up like small little light bulbs are no longer present. That little area at the front there is uh, where he had a wedge resection. Um, so this case highlights the effectiveness of MRI scan at detecting small volume disease, rapid early detection means early treatment and better outcomes. Um, I'll just talk to you a bit about chemosaturation in Southampton. So in Southampton, I'm very fortunate uh, uh, to my colleague, Dr. Stedman, who unfortunately can't be with us today, but um, is having set up uh, the service in Southampton uh, with the rest of our colleagues and the team there. We've got the largest worldwide experience with approximately 160 patients, 160 treatments on 60 patients. Uh, we only do chemosaturation for ocular melanoma liver metastases because that's where there is the greatest evidence. Um, we, we tend to perform chemosaturation on patients who have unresectable liver disease, liver only or liver predominant disease. Um, we, if they have disease outside the liver, it should be amenable to treatment. Uh, less than 50% of liver replacement with tumour and adequate cardiac and hepatic reserve. This is a 
picture of the Delcath circuit. So essentially the, the procedure involves isolating the liver, saturating it with chemotherapy, filtrating the chemotherapy out and replacing that blood back into the body. So the, the basis of the procedure works because uh, the liver has two blood supplies, um, eight, usually 80% from the portal vein and 20% from the hepatic arteries. Liver metastases generally derive their blood supply from the hepatic arteries. So this enables us to deliver liver-directed treatments via the hepatic arteries to have an effect on the tumours without necessarily damaging the rest of the normal liver parenchyma, which is supplied by the portal vein. Um, so this is a picture from, this is a angio angiographic pictures from the, one of the Delcath procedures that I've done. Um, so this is a catheter in the hepatic artery. And so you can see the artery is like a tree. And um, if you imagine this is the main branch and these are the little branches of the tree, uh, the, the Delcath procedure treats the whole liver. So the, if you imagine we inject the chemotherapy into the main trunk of the tree, so then it goes into all the main branches. These things here are, are called uh, embolization coils. Sometimes uh, we have stomach arteries or, or bowel arteries that come off the liver arteries and we don't want to put chemotherapy into those so we block those arteries to protect them. And those organs have multiple blood supplies so that doesn't usually cause any problems. So the procedure involves getting into the liver arteries, delivering the chemotherapy, and this is a picture of the, of the veins. So every organ in the body has a supply from the artery and then the blood is drained out via veins. So these are the hepatic veins that are draining into the IVC, which is the big vein going back up into the heart. So these balloons above and below the hepatic veins isolate the liver so that all the blood that has the chemotherapy in it comes back in through the filter and is cleaned and is put back in through the neck. So essentially, we are bathing the liver in high-dose chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> so there's some studies which have shown... So this is the first study, which was a phase three, three trial in, in the US. And um, these HPFS means hepatic progression-free survival. So um, survival with, uh, without progression in the liver. So it was seven months with the uh, Delcath versus uh, 1.6 months with best alternative care. And overall survival, uh, 5.4 months versus 1.6 months. They had some problems with um, bone marrow suppression in some patients. Um, Delcath have now made a new filter, which is much better at uh, cleaning the uh, melphalan. Uh, from the blood. So in, in the subsequent studies, we've had less incidences of that. So these are some survival curves which show that the red curve here is the um, uh, chemosaturation, which shows a greater survival in hepatic progression and overall progression. This is our study from Southampton, uh, which is performed on 51 patients uh, with the second generation uh, filter. Uh, which, uh, which shows hepatic progression-free survival at 8.1 months and overall progression survival at 9.1 months. Um, overall, we've, we managed to achieve a disease control rate, so either partial or complete response or stable disease in 82% of patients that we performed chemosaturation on. Uh, this most recent study that was presented last month at our interventional radiology meeting is from uh, Leiden. And they have also got similar figures to us in uh, 32 patients they performed Delcathon with survival, overall survival at 15 months. Um, so in summary, um, imaging surveillance is clearly important in ocular melanoma, um, liver metastatic, metastatic disease being the key determinant of overall survival. Uh, MRI liver has the highest specificity and sensitivity for detection of liver metastases. And the early detection of disease is important to enable effective treatment with local regional therapies. Uh, chemosaturation is gaining evidence in the role in the management of liver metastases along with other systemic treatment modalities. Thank you very much.